And as always, your views and comments are welcome on this show. Look for us on our social media handles uh, at Joy News on TV on Facebook. I uh, join us on TV also on Twitter. Send us that tweet with the hashtag The Pulse. We'll be glad to share your thoughts with the rest of the world. We'll begin today in Germany, but it has everything to do with us here in the country. More than 2,000 Ghanaians face deportation back to Ghana after their applications for asylum were rejected. Let's go live now to the German city of Hamburg, where several of them are being held in the detention camps ahead of their deportation. Journalist Kojo Yabua Bremen joins us via Skype this afternoon for more on this developing story. It has been a difficult time for these Ghanaians as we're learning that there have been a number of demonstrations in relation to the decision taken by the German government to have them uh, deported as soon as possible. Let's first of all get to understand what has accounted for the, for the decision today. Um, Mr. Bremen joins us on the line uh, from Hamburg. Mr. Bremen, good afternoon to you. Yeah, good afternoon. And uh, good afternoon. How is um, Ghana doing? Well, Ghana is well, but we're learning that things have dramatically changed in uh, Hamburg in Germany for many of the Ghanaians. Brief us on what's happening currently. Yeah, as earlier, I reported earlier that um, there has been, um, last week Sunday, um, it was a massive demonstration in the camp. Um, this place is called Hema, and uh, it is in West Vectarian. Um, from here to Je um, Dortmund is around uh, 50 kilometers. Um, this camp is a place um, the German perceive is a deportation for people coming from the safe country. And um, now um, people are wondering the concept of the um, safe country. Uh, let me brief listeners um, about the asylum procedure in Ghana, um, in Germany. Um, uh, asylum is one, one in the consti uh, consti uh, constitution in Germany. Um, they protect people who are being threatened or being, because of political reasons, um, will be coming to Germany. But um, from uh, the asylum procedure act, um, when you look at the section 47.1, First sentence states that asylum seekers are normally required by law to live for a period up to six weeks. And uh, after the six weeks, um, um, they will be placed in a, 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 a commune. That's in German word, we call it commune, which means community. That applies to every country or every citizen who apply asylum in Germany. Okay. Um, but recently from, recently, from 2015 to 2000, early um, this year, 2016, okay. Um, it's Kodjo, uh, I do, I do appreciate the process here. Thank you for, you know, sharing that perspective with us on how this whole deportation thing is done. But I would want to hear the personalized stories of these individuals who have been affected by this latest decision being taken by the German government. I know that some of them are with you. Let's hear from some of them on what their peculiar yeah. stories are. Okay. Yes, Enra, remember I said, Enra na assembly CM, and TACN or... And I'm afraid when you say, Oh, I'm away, I'm not a boy, 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 if you'll be kind enough to uh, have your camera positioned properly so we can see the gentleman speaking, we can barely uh, see him uh, speak to us. Right, while well, he does that, just some information for you uh, here on the show. We're learning that some 2,000 Ghanaians have been. Uh, the process has begun for them to be deported. And so that's what we're learning of. It, it has been a busy day for many of these Ghanaians. We're learning that over the weekend, a number of demonstrations actually happened by these Ghanaians saying that they are in no position to return to the country. Even though the president, as we're learning from last year, informed the German government that Ghana is safe, there will be no need for any Ghanaian to come to Germany to seek asylum. So all those ones who had apply to seek asylum in Germany, can safely come back home. That decision is not going down well with many of the Ghanaians uh, in Germany. They want to stay where they are and not come back to the country. Um, I'm just hoping that Kujo's Skype is much better now. Kujo? Yeah, hello, I'm here. Yes, uh, if you could, as I mentioned, uh, frame it well enough so we can see you and speak to you. If, if you could just move the camera down a bit. Okay. All right, great then. So uh, let's hear from some of the individuals and do all to position the camera so we can see their faces and then have them tell us 
how they are taking this whole process and what their peculiar challenges in this matter? Okay, I have with me some of the leaders. You know, everywhere in Ghana, um, uh, we are, we're trying to stay calm. And we have a whole lot of Ghanaians here in this camp. And um, the, it's, it's very um, delicate for me, Femin, but uh, because of um, the problem and also the treatment um, the authorities are giving to the Ghanaians, that's why I've uh, been here as an uh, undercover to uh, reveal every secret for our government to also know what is happening to its citizens in uh, Germany. So I have with me here some of the Ghanaians here, and um, they are willing to speak to the people back home. Let's hear from them now, Kojo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so um, Hello, what's your name? Why are you worried about this deportation? Hi, my name is okay, I'm Dean okay. Michael Michael say okay he, Michael when when did you leave to... Ghana for Germany when they now from Libya from Libya to to Italy have me do Italy no me catch you because me a Santinia cola see a semi catch you now you say your Italy and I yeah your president Edo mama, we obey say. Ah, Ghana for young toy. Oh, room. The a few of them. Ah, any papers. Ah, ba, ah, ba Germany ha. You say me for so. Because Ghana, ah, problems. Who are you? Any say me catch you? Ah, yes, ah, ba, ah, ba Germany ha. But ah, ba we we that country has say. Berlin. Berlin has say. Yeah, Ghana for the. Any problem? To you compare Juma? Oh, Ghana, oh, Ghana, no get problem. Ghana, no get problem. Oh, you see Nigeria for the bar. How Nigeria for? We a president about to come home. Hi, how your man leaders know? How baby actor? How serious? Your mom baby actor? Young Kwa Ghana. Yeah, we we Ghana for the you live for near. How John Bama? John John Mama. Okay, uh, sorry, sorry, Michael. Michael, make that point about yeah. why you think being deported is not the right decision for you. I, I, the, the, almost see. How almost see a president say the problem. The near draw up. The next bar is clear. Bar. I was happy. 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 It's not any because any country that there is no war that you cannot seek asylum. You understand? Because people are living in human right Ghana. There is not, there is Russia for credit. Yes, go ahead. Russia, 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 uh, these are some Ghanaians we're learning uh, in Herma, near Dortmund in Germany. We're learning that the decision has been taken by the German government to have them uh, deported because as of late last year, President John Mahama made it clear that the country is now safe for anyone who's seeking asylum in any part of Germany to come back home. They can't come back home because there is peace and there is access to all the amenities there are in the country. Clearly, these Ghanaians who have sought asylum in Germany are not happy with this decision. They are asking that um, they be allowed to stay. They do not want to come back. But we'll see how this snowballs. We're also trying to get in touch with the uh, German uh, embassy here in Ghana to get to understand what the process will be in bringing uh, these over 2,000 Ghanaians in Germany who do not have the requisite papers and are actually seeking asylum in Germany to come back to Ghana. We'll bring you more on the story as and when we have those details for you. But these are just a few of them we spoke to from Hemme near Dortmund in Germany. We'll bring you more on the story.
later on. You're still watching The Pulse on the Joy News Channel on Mount TV. Still ahead here on the program, we'll look at issues to do with uh, our coastal line and the threats and our fishermen are struggling to keep body and soul together with the developments we're seeing of climate change having its toll. Yesterday, in fact, over the weekend, there was a development in Jamestown. We'll fill you in with all the details after the break. Stay with us. You're welcome back. Now, three months ago, Joy News spent some time looking at the tidal wave phenomenon assuming disaster levels. In fact, a climate change expert predicted that we will see strong tidal waves this month, September, ravage the coastal line in the country. And guess what? That prediction has come true. It's not the kind of news that we will not wish should happen. But the shocking reality is that the sea is rising fast and many homes along Ghana's coastline are being destroyed. In the latest cases of the problem, homes in parts of the Greater Accra and Volta region coastlines were yesterday ravaged by tidal waves. We will be telling you the story in the Volta region in just a moment. But first, uh, some affected residents of Jamestown here in Accra were witness to fishermen losing their canoes to violent waves yesterday. We will bring you that report from Maxwell Agwagba in just a, uh, just a moment. He's been to the community to fill us in on what life has become now in the fishing community. But let's now speak to um, someone who has some experience when it comes to this issue uh, for some more information on this issue. Uh, Let's now speak to uh, Dr. Boating. He is uh, a lecturer at, at the uh, Portmore University. He has a lot of experience when it comes to these issues. Thank you, sir, for joining us uh, today here on the program. It has been predicted for quite some time, but are you surprised with the kind of havoc we're seeing uh, the tidal waves wreck on our coastline? Not at all. I'm not surprised because it's, it's something that has been recurring and um, we know that uh, they are likely to intensify as a result of climate change. So we're going to experience this kind of uh, giant wave uh, from hence and it's, it's going to be more recurring than uh, it was previously. What's causing this? It's, it's just um, the interaction between the sun, the moon and, and, and the earth. What happened is, we. It, is becoming more recurrent because of climate change. And one effect which is increasing the tidal wave phenomena is temperature. As a result of climate change, the temperature is rising. And when we have high sunlight and more high temperature, it creates pressure imbalance. Like more evaporation occurring on the land causes uh, low pressure on the land and high pressure on the sea. And it creates this imbalance whereby, I mean, come on, uh, general geography tell you that air masses move from area of high pressure to area of low pressure. So as a result of low pressure on the land, there should be a balance. And to create a balance, air will move from area of high pressure, which is from the seaside to the land side, which is low pressure, and therefore generate as a result of this movement generates huge wave or high wave which cause this uh, tidal wave in fact tidal wave is often uh, confused with tsunami this is not tsunami tidal wave and tsunami are completely different tsunami is normally caused as a result of displacement or earthquake in the sea and and causes water to rise to the land that's a different from the tidal wave phenomena we are experiencing in Ghana. Okay. Now, the Ghana situation is one that has been troubling. In fact, we've had cause to worry for some time about this. I have in my hand the forecast, the marine forecast you've done for certain areas, Keta, Accra, for Saturday, Sunday. That is what we were to expect over the weekend. Now we're seeing it play out in terms of the, the devastation. Per the forecast I have here, you mentioned that the, the winds were 10 WSW to 14 knots. The waves were height SSW 6 feet with a period of 15 seconds, characterized by small, long period swell. Now, you summarize by saying that this condition 
doesn't look good and therefore fisher folk must take precaution. This is specific to Keta. Is that the highest we've seen so far? No, but uh, I think at the moment that, that is a warning that uh, uh, fishermen and local people living in Keta area should observe. But uh, like I said, it's, it's, this phenomena is caused by high temperature on the land and you observe that there's too much uh, heat are, uh, in the land area as a result of this high temperature. And this creates this pressure imbalance, which is causing wind to move faster towards the land, and this is going to cause this. So it's not the highest we've seen so far, but it's in, uh, high enough to cause some disturbances over okay. uh, this period. Once you say that, then I need to ask, for those living, living in these areas, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not just talking Keta, along our coastal belt here in Accra, should they be considering relocating? Definitely. What happened is that as a result of climate change, this phenomena is going to intensify. And over the years, I mean, it's predicted within uh, the next 20 years that this issue is, uh, the sea level is going to rise, rise very high as a result of this uh, event like tidal waves coming into the land. So it's very important that we do something about it. And for instance, these early warning systems are very important. They will keep, they will save life and, and they, will, they will help to save properties as well. But in the long term, I mean, the prediction for about 2100, like, there's going to be too much uh, uh, rise, uh, too high rise in sea levels. And therefore, we need to plan that people, especially living in the lower areas of Keta and, and I mean, the eastern side of the Volta estuary. And, and the model we have done predict that the safe area that anybody can relocate to is about 22 kilometers inland. 22 because kilometers? 22 kilometers inland. The reason is that we anticipate that these tidal waves are going mm -hmm. to be high, as high as five meters above sea level. And these ones we are experiencing is just little above one meter or 1.5, and it's causing havoc. Assuming we have five meters, it's going to rush into the land. The Keta Lagoon and other areas around it are going to be underwater. So there is the need for the government to plan ahead, get the development and other infrastructure that is needed to, to uh, facilitate this relocation. I know when you tell people now, move, they are not going to, because that's where they know the, the ancestry and everything is in that particular piece of land they live on now. But we need to plan ahead because a time will come, nobody will tell them to leave. They will move on their own. Mm. Now, you paint uh, a very interesting picture for many who will be watching now and, and asking themselves questions. Does that mean that for the next, what, five to ten years, people living in Fuvema in the Volta region, uh, Keta, as you've mentioned, and along the coastal belt, we should all be considering relocating or it's just a few areas? I, I think all the people living in those areas, but those in Fuvume, we're talking about the next four years. Already the effect is severe for everybody to see. By the next four years, I don't think anybody will be able to live in, in that area. But for Keta, it's slightly higher, and therefore we are looking at about, say, 10 years. So it's very important. We, we, we see this as a very serious issue, and we consult the stakeholders and develop the uh, adaptation measures to deal with this. And the, the best adaptation measure is to relocate. The main reason is, is that we cannot be at war with uh, nature and wind. The area is too low. It's, it's too low to understand that if we choose sea defense, that is fine. Mm -hmm. Climate change, we, we will be protected from the sea. But the climate change phenomena is said that it's going, we are going to experience high rainfall as well. And when we have high precipitation in the hinterland, the area can be flooded from behind. You get what I mean? Yeah. Keta segment area can be flooded by Keta Lagoon from behind. So if we are defending, then we are building like a wall around the whole Keta area, which is, which is very difficult and something unsustainable. Therefore, the, the, the best option for us is to pursue this uh, option of relocating in the higher uh, areas uh, around the Kita Lagoon. 
Okay, you've touched on the on the voter situation in Keta Ifuveme, but here in Accra, we were also made to understand that the Independence Square, the Osu Castle, are just two examples of places where we could lose also to these um, tidal waves. Is that also true? That that one is not going to be tidal wave. is is massively going to be erosion because um, development happening. Uh, at the western side of Labadi uh, Beach Hotel, we are building so close to the uh, to the sea. And when you build so close to the sea, with a little uh, event like high wave, you you are tempted to build sea walls. And when you build a sea wall mm. at those areas to protect those high rising buildings over there, we will solidify that place. There will be no erosion, no sediment coming from that place and and the coastal uh, situation you work as a system once you protect or you solidify one particular area then to compensate for the loss of sediment area downdrift will experience erosion so this type of defenses is going to cause massive erosion around usu castle area so it's up to us either we pursue an option of defense or we allow the natural process to take us which will end up destroying the castle and giving the historical uh, value and the heritage of, of the area of Accra. I think the best option for us in that area is to pursue defense. And, and the best defense that I would suggest is that, you know, Jamestown Jetty intersects some sediment that should have uh, spread along the line to, uh, along the shoreline from Jamestown to Tema Port. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, we are having limited sediment across the Usu area. So the best option to pursue beach refeeding, we should get the sand from somewhere. Either we dredge the sand from the sea uh, behind Temajeti area. Now people are dredging those sand and using it for construction, which is a, a wrong thing. We should pursue something like a recycling of sediment. We dredge the, land, uh, the sediment around that area distributed along the Usu to James uh, uh, Town Jetty area, and then allow the natural process to move it along the line, spread it the beach, and over the next five years, maybe it will be dwindled again. We go to Temaport Jetty, which has intercepted all the sediment, dredge it, and, and then spread get some it. More. Okay, Doc, two yeah. quick questions for me on this one. First of all, for the fishermen who ply their trade, they've lost their canoes, they are eager to go back and get their livelihood back, can they go back to sea with what we're seeing happening on our coastline? Yes, they can. But the only thing is that we need to educate them and we need to make these uh, early uh, warning systems working so that from time to time we can prompt them and say maybe from this day to that day, the situation is not good. Secure your canoes, don't go to sea. And when, when the weather system is good, we, we inform them and, and then uh, they can go to sea. I think this kind of uh, issue occur in developed countries and all that they do, that they have this tidal and, and wave climate predictions working and all the time, it's, it's a sort of information like we give weather warnings. Mm. We should have these uh, ocean state uh, weather conditions and we should let uh, fisher folks uh, aware of it so that they can know where to go and when not to go. The last point is about how we deal with this holistically. Who should lead that charge? Should it be a government policy decision or it's squarely within the domain of the EPA? I, I think it's within the uh, domain of uh, all hands on deck because those people affected need to be involved. Most of the time, uh, we have a lot of good policies in Ghana and it's, they are not working because we have pursued all the time top-down approach where government sit somewhere, they make a decision, this is what we want to do. Like I'm talking about uh, resettlement or moving people around that area to the hinterland. Government mm -hmm. will just go to the community and say, this is what we want to do. Obviously, they will um, revenge. They will say, no, we are not going to go. This is our place and that and that. We need to involve them in the discussion from, from day one. Let them know what is about to happen. Give them the hardcore data in, any, in a way that they will understand. So EPA, government, local community should come together and, and sort of in, in, in a holistic and in a collaborative discussion as to what to do to deal with this kind of issue. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Isaac Watson, for your time. Before uh, I go, mm -hmm. I would say that they also have to involve the scientists, the, the academics. Uh, I know people in the uh, uh, University of Ghana and University of Capos who have this knowledge. I've worked with them. And, and if they get the government, get them involved, EPA and other agencies involved, they, we can develop a lasting solution uh, to deal with this issue because right. it has come to see. All right. Thank you uh, so much for your time, Dr. Isaac Boating. He is uh, a coastal engineer and a lecturer at the University of Portsmouth in England. So sharing his views with us on what we need to be doing about this very worrying situation. Yes, we may have seen what we need to do, but let's begin to also appreciate the impact of the tidal waves we've seen in the last few days. First of all, here in Accra, at Jamestown, that fishing community has been largely affected by the tidal wave situation uh, in the country. Max Lagragua spent some time today in Jamestown to understand how bad the situation is. He joins me in the studio with more on this particular story. Uh, good afternoon to you, Max. Good afternoon, Francis. So uh, you've been to Jamestown. Yeah. What did you see for yourself? Well, Francis, um, to cut a long story short, fishing activities have been grounded um, to a halt. So on a Monday like this, you expect you know, fishermen in their canoes and dragging their nets offshore and all that. But what is happening currently is that nothing is happening. What they are doing is just dragging the remnants of the nets that have been you know, taken away by the sea. So the, switch, the thing actually happened on Saturday. But what is happening right now is that um, the sea is bringing back you know, the debris of the canoe and then um, the fishing nets that were taken away. So what they are doing is just salvaging the rest and the remnants of what they can find. I caught up with some um, fishermen um, there this morning dragging the nets. So maybe you can see that. Yeah. Okay, so this is the situation here at the Mensa Guinea Beach. This fisherman, you see here numbering about 15, dragging their nets from the sea. They started from that point and now they are here. They tell me that this fishing nets can never be put to any use again. So as it stands right now, everything has been completely destroyed. It's a sad situation here at Mensa Guinea Beach and it's a sad one for these fishermen also. Okay. I find a man telling your boy, next neck black, I can show him. Lady six. Lady six. Lady six. Old currency. Old currency. Mm. 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 Okay, okay. Mm. Come and mm. Come and 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 Mm. for some time Energy first time in and local ocean and can't wait. Mm. 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 Right, so those are some uh, fishermen speaking to Maxwell today. Maxwell, yeah. quick translation for us of what they were saying in Ghana. Okay, so essentially what they were saying in Ghana is that they've lost everything of the years. They've lost all their fishing you know, equipment. Um, what it means right now for them is that it's very difficult for them to go and um, to go fishing. The last man that you heard is saying that he's pleading, he's calling on government to come, you know, to their aid. But apart from um, what we just saw, the fishermen dragging their nets mm -hmm. and the remnants of their nets, there's also the issue of environmental, you know, pollution at the Jamestown. If you go to Jamestown, there's a community very close to uh, where the old harbour is situated. What is happening now is that the sea is bringing all, you know, the debts, um, I mean, the 
collecting bags, the plastics, and all that you can think of, you know, yeah. bringing it very close to the community. And it's, it poses a health you know, hazard to a lot of people who stay there. Let's see what that is exactly. Now let's get closer to the ocean and see exactly what is happening this morning. It looks like the situation is still the same. You know, nothing has really changed. The tidal wave is still high. Oh, okay, so you just saw what happened uh, to me. Let's get closer and see what is happening. It looks like it's that this mini sea defense that has been put here is not really helping the situation. As you can rightly see, the ocean water, the strong ocean water, climbs over this mini um, sea defense and then runs into um, this community very close um, to the Jamestown. Now you can see, apart from the damage that it has left in its patch, you can also see the pollution, the environmental pollution. I mean, these are plastic materials deposited all over here. You can see the dirt. Look at this one here. Right here, also, you can see a lot of plastic materials, a lot of um, polythene bags, all coming from the sea. You can see the conditions. This woman here is trying to wash her clothes. Um, there's some cooking also going on here. It's not just, it's not just about you know, uh, the pollution. It's not, it's, it's not just about a strong tidal wave destroying properties belonging to fishermen living on the coastline here. It is also about the health hazard that this poses to the people here. Now, let's get closer. Let's see what it is like uh, in here. So this is it. This is a mini sea defense that's been put in place by the resident. But it looks like it's not helping. It's not helping the situation. Here is it. The ocean water is so strong, and it looks furious and angry. I've been staying almost 15 years. But once we are living here, that is not how it really look like. But they come and demolish their shelters and all those things. But there's a round wall here. This side, but they broke all the walls and things. So now, if the uh, the wave come, it come close to us. First, the wave doesn't come close to us, but now the wave come close to us. And then once the wave come, it brings some garbage and all those things. But right now, what we need here is we need some uh, cleaning up things to clean up this garbage and all those things. So I appeal the government maybe can help us to clean up these things. Up. It has been dangerous because of the war. Right now, first there's a distance between the airborne and then the, this thing. The first there's a distance. Yeah. But right now when they demolish every shelters, we just build it around every place we just find it up. Mm. That's why I build it up here. And once I build it up here, the, rain, the water is not coming close. But right now the water is coming close, so I cannot build my shelter and nothing no more. Right, so uh, that's Maxwell speaking to the residents there. So you look at the story, it's not just a simple case of climate change, tidal waves affecting people. It, it's a very interesting mix there. The kind of things that the sea is also giving back uh, as it doesn't like in yeah. uh, its, its, its waters. But Maxwell, mm -hmm. there's another compelling story we need to tell at this yeah. moment. When, when we talk about the impact of these things, mm -hmm. often we, we look at it on, on a very broad level. But what's that personalized story of that individual you have for us today? Um, so I met a gentleman um, at a show. What he was doing was that he was collecting his nets also, apart from those guys that I met earlier. And he tells me that he has a family of 25 people to feed, and he's a sole breadwinner for that family. So as it stands right now, it looks like that title is going to be off him because he's not going to get any money anywhere to, you know, to feed those ones. What we also saw that was interesting was that we met the wives of the fishermen who lost their properties in this, um, what I want to call a disaster, because it's really a disaster. About 25 boats were lost in um, what, you know, what happened at the Jamestown. So the wives were actually telling us um, what they've come there to do. I hear uh, information we picked on the grounds was that the owner of one of the boats came to the seashore to ascertain for himself what has really happened. And then there he collapsed and he was taken to the 37 military hospital. hospital. Yeah. Difficult times for them. Difficult let's let's see what you captured yeah. in that video of this very, very sad story. This is Mensa Guinea. Uh, a lot of the fins that were carried away by the seaways were actually deposited here. This fishing net that you see belongs to this group of fishermen standing very close to me. And what they are doing right now is to salvage the rest of the fishing nets that they have. And you can see them with shovels trying to dig around where the net has been buried. It's a strong work for them. It's really difficult trying to get this thing out. So what they are doing right now is to get a sound around it. It's here at Mensa Guinea, and this is what is happening right now. Right across, you can see a lot of people standing there. So, exactly this thing happened. 
we, we came to a fish. We don't have, not see anything. We don't see our legs, our boats, our everything. From ye yesterday morning, we can we see say all coming down from the sea. From yesterday, we can we we'll stop it here. Wow. We, the time we stop the boat, but our net all go there, mm. down there. Today is Monday. You are supposed to go on fishing today. So why have you not gone on fishing today? Because our net is spoiled. Mm. That's why we not go fish today. To we lost how much of us? 2.5 billion, 3 billion. 2.5 billion uh, old cities. Old cities, about old cities. Old cities. So you lost everything. We lost. We lost. Uh, we don't see our boat. We are putting mm. also square. Mm. Machine. Everything square. How many people are in your family? Oh, we are about almost 25, 30. Family. 25, 30 people, yeah. and you take off all of them. Yes. And now that you've lost everything, what exactly? What are you going to do? My brother, the, the team is the team, the owner of the team. This is our idea. 37. Mm. Yesterday can be a collapse, so we did 37 right now. It's a 37 right yes. now. Yes. Wow. What help do you want to be? I mean, to be given to you? What kind of help? I want government to help us, to support us to make all, 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 everything small. We want to so support us to make our business small. So this woman standing right here behind me are the wives of the fishermen who lost all their fishing properties in this sad, unfortunate event. You want to call it? They are here providing solidarity and also help to find uh, the other boats and canoes and fishing nets that were carried away. We hear the debris have been deposited here and they are helping their husbands to trace all the things that they lost. Manke 12, Nini is happy. In short, if it's your honor, she is happy in your honor. I can show you today, when I'm on the beef today, me and the machine, and one and no more. My family be here, but I'm a family. 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 Okay, so what Ma is saying essentially is that they got information about this unfortunate incident on Saturday evening. Saturday dawn, actually, around 12 o'clock a.m. When they came to the beach, they did not see anything here at the beach. So they went back home, and then they came back, and then they saw the fishing nets buried deep under the sand. They saw the broken canoes and all of that. Roma, okay. Eh, la come a beko clubite. Na o fe yen pata. Dani ka je osu shona. Ka ba gbe. Ka ya la gba fe potiano. Na la je pi yen pata e je mi. Okay, so o pa da be te fai. Okay. Ko ne bo e modern ha wo. E ta ba nje ko ne fa wo shikanu wo ka sa. No ne ba wo na ko eko da. E ho manke na atwa. A ke lele ji yen fite. Fe so we still at Jamestown where the fishermen here are still counting their losses. As you just saw, uh, this is an outboard motor that was carried um, away by the strong tidal waves um, yesterday. This one also that you see over here is completely out of use at this point. These fishing nets are also totally destroyed. So now what they are doing is that they're just picking remnants of the fishing nets and the outboard motors from Mensa Guinea where all these fishing equipment that you see here were deposited some few hours ago. These gentlemen here are trying so hard to salvage the last of everything that they can find. What is going on here? It's so much confusion, so much frustration, and then so much anger at the tidal waves. Mm. Mm. Right, so uh, that's the picture from uh, Jamestown today. Quite a difficult one. You look at the effects of this um, tidal waves. It's not only affecting people's homes, but their livelihoods as well have been lost as a result. Let's see what government does about it. We are learning that some government officials have been to Jamestown already today to assess the situation. Let's see if any action comes out of their assessment so that people in these areas get some help as soon as possible.